Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. And let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke. Amen. The book of Luke, praise God. And we're going to actually specify uh, just uh, a few things this morning to contribute to uh, the fact that this is Ministry of Help Sunday. Now, we have been in a, in a series over the past uh, couple months, actually, uh, a series titled The Miracles of Jesus. And we, we started out talking uh, and teaching and studying the Bible together along the lines of the subject of miracles. And we talked about the difference between what many people reference as a miracle, which is actually just a, a function of God's plan. It, it's, it's, it doesn't really come, as we might say, come up to the definition of what a miracle is. For a miracle uh, is literally the suspension of all of the laws of nature. It's, it suspends the laws of gravity or the laws of physics, uh, the, the, the laws of motion, uh, and, and, uh, because God is not bound by such things. Uh, when, when a man of God prays and, and Almighty God determines and decides uh, and prompts that prayer in the first place that the sun should stand still in the sky, see, NASA can't do that. Name me one government on earth that can stop this, earth, this world from rotating. Uh, or, or revolving, stop the entire solar system uh, just, so, just so some people of God could win their battle. Uh, and that's in accordance with his will. Uh, and, and it takes place. Uh, a miracle is when an axe head flies off the axe handle and, and, and falls in the river. And someone cries out to the prophet. And the prophet breaks off a stick and throws it in the river and the axe head floats. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. When a little girl that's a virgin has never had relations with a man and she uh, uh, comes to be with child of the Holy Ghost, that's a suspension of all the natural laws that God's instilled uh, and installed into the earth and into the entire system of life. Uh, and when that takes place and when that happens, see, when a river runs backwards, uh, that, that's a miracle, a biblical miracle. And when the dead rise, when the dead rise, that's just not something that happens every day. Yeah, that's not that, that, that that's a miracle. So we we've looked through uh, we started in the book of John and the reason we started in the book of John is specifically because it says there this is the first miracle that Jesus did. Remember which one it was? John chapter 2, turned the water into wine, uh, had the water pots, filled them up with water, uh, and add, they drew it out, and as they were going to bear it to the governor of the feast, it was, it was made, into, made into wine. What was the second miracle? Remember, it says right there in John, it says, and this was the second miracle. That was the nobleman's son. That was the nobleman's son. That was the second miracle. And we found there were seven miracles in the Gospel of John, and we looked at each and every one of them. One of the things that has stood out to us throughout this study, and we've taken up those, and then there was actually an eighth miracle, if you remember, the eighth miracle in the Gospel of John, that was after his earthly ministry because he had already been crucified, he'd already been buried, already uh, uh, been raised from the dead, already been to heaven to offer the eternal redemptive sacrifice of his blood, then came back. And during that 40-day period that he was back, if you remember, uh, they went fishing. They went fishing. It's biblical. So they went fishing. Uh, and, and if you remember, they caught nothing. I'm not even going to say that's biblical, but they caught nothing. Okay, so they went out and didn't catch anything. Uh, and, and then he hailed them from shore, and he said, cast your net on the right side of the ship. And they had 153 fish in the net. Remember that? And, and drew it to shore. Well, we noticed in that, and we noticed throughout the different miracles that in many, many, many cases, there is a human element involved, if you remember it. It's a miracle. No one can take credit for it. Now, that's a problem sometimes. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a problem. problem. It's a problem. Say it. It's a problem sometimes. Come on. It's a problem sometimes that we, uh, as human beings, it's easier to say they, because that means other people, but, but we as human beings, especially Christians, 
then somehow we want to reach out and we want to point out that, well, we contributed to that miracle. Somehow we had something to do with that. Somehow it was our participation. Now the Lord may have allowed us to participate in that, but it's, it's really important for us to know. I remember right now, uh, how many of you remember a man by the name of uh, Oral Roberts? Oral Roberts is one of the, he's been named, not, not even by, in Christian circles, one of the most influential leaders of the 20th century. One of the most influential leaders of the 20th century was Oral Roberts. Uh, and uh, Oral Roberts' mother, when he first started ministry, 17 years old, he was going off into ministry, and Oral Roberts' mother gave him this advice. She said, never touch God's glory. He said, never touch the gold and never touch God's glory. And number two, always stay small in your own eyes. See, if you remember, there have been a couple people in your Bible, and you don't want to be like either one of them. One of them was in 1 Samuel chapter 15. One of them was in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and the prophet came up and looked and said, when you were small in your own eyes. But see, one day he got big in his own eyes. He got big in his own eyes. In his own eyes. eyes. See, and King Uzziah, see, when he was small in his own eyes, he was humble. That means you're humble. That means you're broken. That means you're contrite. That means you don't have the big head. That means you're not arrogant. That means you're not haughty. That means you don't think God can't somehow possibly get along without you. He got along just fine without me before, before 1960. And, and, and he got, he's going to get along just fine without me after I'm on, on my way to heaven shouting victory, singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus set me free. Uh huh. And, and and he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't need me. Remember the definition uh, that uh, uh, that we have uh, of God, and part of that definition is he needs nothing. He's created. Right. He, he he's not he's not bound to 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 need. Uh, he'll he'll find he'll find he'll find somebody else to do it. Right. Believe you me. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Judas can be replaced. Right. And was, yeah, and was. Amen. <clears throat> and all of those 12 disciples, praise the Lord. And, and Paul and, and, and Peter and everybody, in the, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, their jobs are done. We've taken it up now. Amen. And we'll be faithful. Amen. Yeah, and we'll be faithful. Amen. But there is a human element. There's a human element many times, and we'll see it again here. We saw it in the book of John. And, and just be cautious of... of of taking credit, of touching the glory that, 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 that only goes to, uh, to our God. He did it. If he allows us to be part of it, if he allows us to help with it, if he uh, allows us to be some component in the entire equation of a miracle that takes place, so be it. But it's still his power and his power alone that manifests miracles. It certainly isn't by my power, or I'd make a mess of everything and do one every day, at least one. Most of us would do miracles to our own benefit. (coughs) Praise the Lord, somebody. We look then at the book of Matthew, and we saw that there were several of those miracles that were repeats. And uh, then we looked at the book of Mark, and we found out that nearly all of the miracles that the book of Mark records were already covered in Matthew and in John. And now we're to the book of Luke. And we're actually going to skip over the first two chapters because in just about a week or two, we're going to be looking at all of those in detail as we approach the Christmas and holiday season. And... and, uh, Uh, We can say Christmas here. We can say praise the Lord here. We can say God bless America here. Yeah, amen. And so Christmas is is, is soon coming. And so we'll look at the first great set of miracles in the uh, in the book of uh, uh, of of Luke starting in chapter 1 with Zechariah and Elizabeth and the angel Gabriel coming to this young girl named Mary and then chapter 2 and then chapter 2 
the birth of Christ, the birth God coming into the planet as a human, born as a baby, born as an infant. That's the way every human comes. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll look at that. This morning, let's open to chapter 5 in the book of Luke. And, and the, first, the first miracle that we have here, uh, and, and let's look through it again, just as we've done with the other three Gospels, and look at these different accounts of miracles and how the principles given to us in them might benefit us and how we might incorporate those into life. Chapter 5 of Luke, starting with verse 1. And it came to pass. Don't ever forget that. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Let that be one of your verses. This, This came to pass. That as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. Don't you love hungry people? These are people that are early to church. These are people that stand in line. These are people that drive 100 miles. These are people that drive... 500 miles. These are people that, that, that get up early. These are people that get their kids ready. They came and they pressed up against him to hear the word of God. And he stood by the lake. Gen- Thank you for your enthusiasm. I don't know if I saw anybody turn and look at three or four people around him and say, that reminds me of you. Came to pass the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the... I wonder if that's why people come to church. I know churches, and and the fourth Sunday, the one I'm thinking of, the fourth Sunday of every month, they have a spike in church attendance because they have free dinner after church. And in the summer, they do cookouts out in the parking lot. And in the winter, they have potluck and, and, or pot bless, if that's your deal. You know, I just eat it. You know. and, 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 and there's free lunch, free lunch after service on Sunday. And they have a 50% spike in attendance. Something tells me they're not pressing up against to hear the word of God. They're coming for banana cream pudding is what they're coming for. Not God's word. And, and, and uh, you know, other people, praise the Lord. I've watched them. I've watched them over the years. They don't come to hear the word of God. They come because they like music. Come on. I mean, they go somewhere on Friday night and they like music. And they go somewhere on Saturday night and they like music. And they come to church on Sunday because they like music. And then come time for God's word, they tune out. Yep. Or they get up and leave. Uh-huh. Or they get up and leave. I've seen people. I've had them say, Pastor, church, this church is just wonderful. You have a nursery. It's the only chance I get to be away from my kids for an hour all week. All right, enjoy the nursery and enjoy the praise and worship, but come to hear the word of God. Amen. They pressed up against him to hear the word of God. And he saw two ships. I mean, he's down, he's, I mean, crowds, multitudes of people. And, 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 they got, and he's down to the, he's right down to the edge of the water. And they're pressing against him, and they want to get close, and they want to hear. They don't want to miss a word, and 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 he's getting. And finally, he sees two boats, and and so he 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 looks at the owners of these boats and says, uh, uh, you "Mind if I use your boat? Mind if I use your boat there?" And, and uh, the fishermen were out of them. They were over to the side washing their nets. See, they had been out fishing, and this is kind of a, you know, at least they're consistent. They fished all night long, didn't catch anything, like again. Okay. And, 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 and they were over washing their nets. And he entered one of the ships that was Simon's. And he prayed him that he would push out a little ways from land. And then he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, I've threatened to do this over the years. I don't recall. I think I only did it one time where, you know, it would be biblical if I sat down and you all stood up. I don't see any takers. I didn't see anybody jump up, so I guess I'll be the one standing up again. But see, he, he sat down in the boat, and they all stood up. Amen. And nobody crabbed about it. That's right. Amen. They didn't even have padded pews, let alone cushy padded chairs. They stood on the bank, and he pushed out just a little bit. Think about it. It's a, it's a natural amphitheater. Your voice carries over the water. He pushed out a little bit, and he started speaking with the first AV system. Yeah, a lake. And, and, and uh, sat down, and he taught the people out of the ship. And when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, push your boat out into deep water now and let down your nets for a great catch of fish. And of course, Simon, like most of us, you know, just be logical about this and think this through. 
and, and there's nothing wrong with thinking. The Bible does not say by the removing of your mind. It says by the renewing of your mind, you ought to think things through. You, you ought to have a plan. You, you ought to consider uh, the end of your, uh, the result of your actions. Many people don't. You ought to count the cost. And then that's all considering. And Peter answered to him and said, Master, we have toiled. That means we have worked diligently. We have worked hard. All night long, and we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. You ought to underline that. That ought to be highlighted in every Christian's Bible. They ought to do that before they sell the Bible. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. At your word, I will. When, when, when you read in your Bible, and it says in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Drop it, loose it, let it go, let it drop. You ought to just look at that and say, I know what they did to me. I know what they said to me. I know what they're trying to bring harm to me. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. At your word, I will. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and sacrificially gave himself for it. Yeah, but you don't know the one I'm married to, Lord. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. At your word, I will. Honor your father and mother, but you don't know my father and mother. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. Bring all your tithe into the storehouse. Yeah, but you don't know how many different things broke this week. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. At your word, I will. Pray for those in authority over your life. Yeah, but uh, you don't know how they voted in the last session, and I don't know how they got reelected in this session, but they did. And, and, but nevertheless, at your word, I will. Amen. That's applicable to you and I. Peter said, I tried that already. I did it. I had no success. We totally flopped, blew up in our face, waste of our effort, waste of our resources, waste of our time. We already did that. We tried it. It didn't work. We caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. You want to see miracles? You want to see God show up? You want to see him do miraculous, mighty things that, that, that you've never seen before? Just act according to his word. Put his word into action in your life and, and do what he says. Just do what he says. That's the very first miracle we looked at, and we're wrapping this series up now this week and next week, and we'll be done, and, and we come right back to it again. She looked at him and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Hallelujah. Whatever he says to do, just do it. And, and make sure you remind God, that's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this because it looks good. I'm not doing this so I got a testimony. I'm not doing this. I'm just doing this because you said to. Lord, you said to do this, and, 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 and I've done it. I'm thinking of a, a, a check, Paula, you and I sent to someone. I mean, they meant to do us harm. They, flat, they, they, they did, uh, and they meant to, and they meant to. Uh, and uh, say, what would you do? How would you get them back? I sent them a $500 check. Okay. Why did you do that? Because my Bible says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. Uh, I can't erase it out of my Bible because I don't like it. I, I can't say I'm not going to do that because I found this break the teeth of the ungodly verse over here that I like better. <laughs> God, you break their teeth, but I'm calling. You told me to bless them. So you break their teeth, I'll bless them, uh, and, and, and I'll do good to them. And I'll do good to them. I've sent people gift cards in the mail. I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've talked nice about people just, just, just because they cursed me. Just because. I'll find something nice to say about them. Yeah. Might not even believe it, but I'll say something nice about them. <laughs> Why? Nevertheless, at your word, I will. Yeah. And, and I'll talk to the Lord about it. And I'll say, I'm, 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 I'm putting you on notice right now. I'm doing what your word says. I don't feel like it. I, 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 don't, I might not even like it, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because you said to do it, and that's the only reason I'm going to do it. They don't deserve it. They didn't certainly earn it. I'm not happy about it, but I don't have to be happy about it. I'm happy about obeying God. Yes. Do what he says. I said, do what he says. Amen. 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 Thank you for your enthusiasm here at Living Word. And when they had done this, don't you love this part, though? Verse 6. We tried that already, but you said to do it, so we're going to. Yeah. And, and they let down the net. We pointed out before that he said let down the nets, plural, and they let down the net, single. 
So they did almost what he said. They did, they did almost. But I mean, you're already out washing the nets, right? That's what it said. You're already out cleaning them. You're already out, you know, putting them away, hanging them up to, uh, to dry. Okay, all right. We won't get beside ourselves and get too fanatical and go totally all in. But, but you know, we'll, and, and so they let down the net. They let down the net. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net broke. And their net broke. See, here's what Proverbs chapter 10 says. It says, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it. Amen. If it's the blessing of the Lord, it's not going to destroy you. It's, if it's the blessing of the Lord, it's not going to sink your boat. It's the blessing of the Lord is not going to tear your nets up getting it. Amen. They'd have done what he said. Their nets wouldn't have broken, but now their nets began, their net began to break and it began to tear and they beckoned, they motioned to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and they filled both ships. See, both ships had nets in them and there were enough fish there and they filled both ships, both ships, so that they both began to sink. That is a lot of fish. I don't think I've ever, I've been in a quite a number of different boats and I've never been in a boat that I think we could fill up with fish and sink the boat. I like miracles like this, a net breaking boat sinking load. They had so many fish in one net that they filled both boats and both boats. Can't you see these boats? I mean, they got two, three, four people in them and, and, and they're like that, that close to the water level. Full of fish, just, just full, just full. And finally, after that, look what happens. And Peter saw it and fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me, I'm a sinner. Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. I mean, he's overwhelmed. He knows who he's in, in the presence of right here, right now. He knows that he's a fisherman and he should have caught, if there were fish here, he's going to catch these fish. And he told him, he just told, and, and I just did what he said, and, 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 and this is what happened. And he turned around and he called him Lord. And he turned around, he fell on his knees, and he was astonished. And all that were with him at the great catch of fish that had been taken. And so also was James and John, sons of Debedee, Zebedee, who were his partners. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From henceforth, you're catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all. That means they left the fish. That means they left the nets. That means they left the boats. They caught something far more valuable than boats and nets and fish. So many people, they'd get their eyes on the sparkly, shiny things, on the dollar signs, on the things of temporal, worldly, earthly value. And they'd think that that was the miracle and God wanted to bless me and prosper me. Sure he did. But what he wanted more so here was to open their eyes, the eyes of their heart, to see they were standing in the presence of God who became flesh and that dwelled among us and become a follower of his all of their days, which they did. Which they did. Now, there's another beautiful part of this particular story, and that's getting the ascendancy over the love of money and the love of things. Yeah. See, it wasn't Peter, and it wasn't James, and it wasn't John that had the problem with money that eventually cost them their ministry and their position and their life. That was Judas. That was Judas. He was the one carrying the bag. He was the one who was stealing out of the bag. He was the one who for 30 measly pieces of silver, he betrayed our own, our, our own redeemer. All for money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And while some have coveted after it, not all, you can have money and not covet after money. You can have no money and covet after money. It doesn't matter if you have money or don't have. You, you, can, have, you can have billions of dollars and not be covetous not be greedy. You can be generous. You can, you can have 25 cents and be covetous and be, and, and be greedy and, and, and love money. But, but here's what my Bible says. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. You look at it right up here on the screen. I can't erase it because I don't like it. Go, go, go back to verse 10 and 11. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... For the love of... Say it with me. For the... 
Love of money. Not money. Money is not the root of all evil. Now think about that. They had the opportunity to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and become one of his disciples. Or say, we can't leave all this fish here. It'll spoil. This is our, this, 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 this is our source of income. There are people who their source of income, that is their ministry, and that is their following the Lord. Romans chapter 12 lists as one of the seven motivations, one of the seven motivational gifts, one of the gracings of God is giving. There are people God uses, they give more in a month than other people give in a lifetime. And God blesses the works of their hands and God prospers them and other people get jealous about it and other people can't figure it out and they give more money away to ministries and they support and help their church in every ministry they do. They give away cars and houses and boats and lands and, 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 and people get angry about it. Criticize them for doing only what the Lord anointed them to do. That's their, that's their, that's their job. That's their ministry. But those same people are addressed also later on in that chapter, in verse, I believe it's 18. Skip ahead to verse 18 up there on the screen. Go, go to 17, and we'll read 17 and 18. And it says, charge them that are rich in this world. Same chapter. Charge them. What does that mean? Command them. Command them that are rich in this world that they be not arrogant, high-minded, proud, haughty about it. Think they're superior of greater value because they have stuff. Charge them that are rich in this world that they, number one, not be prideful. Number two, that they not trust in those uncertain riches. Number three, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He's not done yet. The next verse says that they do good, be rich in good works, be ready to distribute, be ready to share, be ready to give, willing, willing to communicate. And that's that word share with all. So he addresses that there, but back in 10 and 11, he says to all of us, all of us have to guard our heart from that. All of us have to guard our heart against covetousness, amongst other things. But, but it says here, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after. See that word some? Don't be one of those. Amen. Proverbs chapter 1 says, prosperity will destroy a fool. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Say, Lord, you can trust me with prosperity. It's not, it's not going to cause me to cause me to be arrogant. It's not going to cause me to leave you. It's not going to cause me to turn my back on your cause. I'm going to continue to be generous, continue to live to give, uh, continue to share with others. I'm going to continue to glorify your name. I'm going to continue to make you first and foremost in my life. If it comes, it comes. If it goes, it goes. Amen. I'll continue to seek you first. The love of money is root of all evil. Some have covered it after. They have erred from the faith. See, they get their eyes on money instead of on, on our God. And, 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 and he's the source of everything, our source and our supply. They've erred from the faith. That means turned aside from the faith. And look at the rest of it. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Next verse. But you, O man of God, flee those things. Flee those things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So there you go. I love the word and I'm a doer of it. Yeah, flee those things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. All right, back to, back to Luke then. Uh, and, and, and let's finish up this miracle, Luke chapter 5. And, and they, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. Uh, I'm not one who just uh, subs uh, subscribes to uh, that everyone's going to have to just leave everything. Uh, but there are those in our Bible, they left their families, they left their posts, they left their employment, they left their country, they left their people, and, and, and they forsook everything. They forsook everything. The rich young ruler, he was told, sell everything you have. Give all that, because that's the thing that was, that, that was a stumbling block to him, to him. But I'm just going to encourage you, I just want to encourage you, whatever you have to leave and whatever you have to leave behind to follow the Christ, to follow the Messiah, to follow the Lord of all, 
It may not seem worth it in the moment. It may seem very difficult and challenging in the moment, but it'd be worth it in the end. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Don't you ever leave him or forsake him. But anything else you have to forsake to follow him, let it go. Anything else you have to forsake to follow him, let it go. It may seem in the moment like this position or this relationship or, or, or whatever that is would be advantageous to hang on to, but only in the moment. But only in the moment. Don't be unwilling to forsake anything. Now, because it is Ministry of Helps Sunday, let's, let's stop and, and, and analyze this. Did Jesus have any help? Did anybody step up and, and assist Jesus in the portion of Scripture, the 11 verses we just read? Well, he sure did. Uh, he had people, and they were pressing upon him, and he looked out, and he said, may I use your boat? May I use your boat? And Peter, I mean, he was done fishing. You ever been up all night, and you just want to crash? <laughs> Anybody? You've just been up all night long, and it's just like, leave me alone. I was in the hospital last Sunday night and Monday, and, and it's like, can't you just leave me alone for like 10 minutes? While I sleep, poke me, prod me, stick something else into me. Come in and check. You took my blood pressure eight <laughs> seconds ago, and you got to come in and, and, and take it again. Leave me alone. Peter's been up all night long fishing. I've never been up all night. Have I ever been up all night long fishing? I've been, I've been out at, at night sometimes, but I've never been out all night long ever fishing. And I've driven, ever driven all night long? I can drive at night, but boy, when that sun starts coming up. And Peter's been up all night long. And they're washing the nets. That means all they have to do is hang them, and they get to go home and crash. And now the preacher says, I need to use your vehicle there. <laughs> and, and it's not just like, okay, yeah, well, here's the keys. You know, here's the oar. Go ahead. He says, Push me out a little bit from land. It's like, all right, preacher. And, 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 and Peter gets involved with helping Jesus preach the gospel to all these people. Peter's in the ministry of helps. He's not even a disciple yet. Not saved. He's certainly not sanctified. He, he's, he's not even consecrated. I mean, he's a sinner, and he recognizes it, and he admits it. And, and, uh, uh, and, and he, he's, he's a fisherman. And so he pushes his boat out. You want to see somebody disinterested in what the preacher has to say? I mean, he's fighting it. He's trying to keep his eyes open in the back. And he's, you know, oh, bro. And you're on the water. And so you're like this. It's like nature's waterbed. You know, you're out there. You've been up all night long, toiling, working hard. And you're like, oh, yes, amen, pastor. Hallelujah. But he's caught up, in, he's caught up in, in, in the first miracle in the book of, of Luke. He's caught up in this great, great, great miracle that's going to result in Peter, James, and John, the inner circle of the Lord Jesus Christ for his whole earthly ministry. The only three that were on the Mount of Transfiguration, one of the other miracles that we'll see in Luke, and that see him, and Peter's caught up in this and doesn't even know it. All we know about Peter is he said yes. When are you going to be given an opportunity to do something for the Lord, something menial, something trivial, something temporal, and you just pass it by, and you might miss something as great, maybe even greater, than this right here, than this right here. Mordecai Ham. Remember that name? Mordecai Ham. Never wrote a book. As far as we know, never made one tape of any message he preached or taught. 
Didn't have a world headquarters. Didn't have a newsletter. Didn't have a website because they didn't have computers. All he did was preach a real simple little gospel message. Traveled to small country churches. Preached a little gospel message, gave an altar call, went home. Nobody knew of him, wasn't famous, wasn't world-renowned. He was just faithful. And one night, this little boy, first name was William, he stepped out of the pew and he walked up the aisle. gave his heart to Jesus. The call of an evangelist came on Billy Graham that night as he got saved in one of Mordecai Ham's little country church services. He never knew that the greatest evangelist of all modern times, Billy Graham, got saved at the altar just because he obeyed God and decided to do something for God. Everybody talks about how many hundreds of millions of people gave their hearts to Christ under Billy Graham's ministry. Not many people remember every one of them go on Mordecai Ham's list of rewards because he was faithful to just do one small thing that the Lord gave him to do. I bought a little plaque. I keep it over in my office. When I don't feel like coming up here, when I don't feel like answering an email or even talking on the phone, I look over at that plaque now. I look at it. It says, always be strong. Because you never know who you're encouraging. I don't know which one of our little kids over here in our Sunday school which one of the babies in our nursery, or which one of you sitting right here every Sunday service might just need one more encouragement to put you over. Might just need one more example that he isn't quitting, I'm not going to quit. I don't know how many people streaming through that, that camera or those cameras are going to go out and they're going to do something world-changing for our Christ and for his cause that maybe they wouldn't have done if I'd have passed by the opportunity and wouldn't have forsaken all to follow him. Your living epistle, known and read of all men, live like it. You never know whose life that you may be affecting. Amen. Let's go on to the, uh, to the next one. The next one uh, is found in Luke chapter 7. The next miracle here in the book of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 7. This is one of those miracles that is not found anywhere else in any of the other Gospels. And we don't see any human involvement whatsoever. This is just Jesus walking in on the scene. And I love the balance of the Bible, don't you? Because we can see in one where Jesus is, it, it, it appears, he's, uh, he's, he's totally uh, dependent on Peter's boat. And if Peter doesn't push him out from land in that boat, we never have Peter, James, and John. And we don't have the boat sinking, net breaking load. And, and, and we don't have Jesus preaching to this great multitude. He's stuck on the seashore and he's probably backing up into the water and, 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 and going like this. And, and he, he's getting out. And that's not very comfortable to preach in like that. So. And, 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 and yet he does have participation. He has participation from James and John. They get out there and they get involved with it. And they can't, they, I mean, they're astounded at, at how many fish. It says they likewise. They're, 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 they're all, they know, they know they just got caught up in a miracle. Paula, I wonder sometimes 
how long it's going to be before some people get past thinking they just come to church here and they don't realize they've been caught up in a miracle. Been caught up in something that the God of heaven, the God of the eternities is doing. That it wasn't just church after all. That it wasn't just finding a building that was an old welding and steel fabrication shop. That it wasn't just happenstance and circumstance and luck of the draw and just the way the cookie crumbles and, and, and it just happened. That they really, really got caught up in something that the eternal God destined and put together and planned all along. Now, when we get over in chapter 7, when we get to the city of Nain, we don't see anybody involved. We, we don't see. And again, I love the balance of the Bible because we can see that about the time we get to thinking, well, he's dependent on us. He's dependent on our giving. He's... And Elijah went and sat down by the brook Cherith. And the ravens, God didn't have any people. He had nobody. Nobody's going to take care of the preacher, not when they're starving to death themselves. Are you kidding me? They're going to do what the little widow woman was doing. She's going to take care of her and her son, eat that cake, split it between the two of us, and then we're going to die. He didn't need people. He's got ravens. And if he doesn't have ravens because he's in the desert, he'll just rain it out of heaven. I love the balance of the Bible because in the first miracle, it looks like, wow, he's dependent on these guys and, 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 and they, get to, they get to help and participate. He couldn't have done it without them. He walks into town the next day and there's a dead guy on, on his, and they're, and they're carrying him through uh, town and he just stops, raises him up, hands him back to the mom and nobody else is involved. Our God can do what he wants, when he wants, to whomever he wants, however often he wants, doesn't need anybody else's participation and doesn't need my permission. Amen. He's God. Amen. I said he's God. Yeah. He does not need my prayer. I, I, I get amused at people's doctrine when, when they don't take the whole counsel of God's word. Well, God can do nothing unless a believer prays. That, I mean, that's some you know, great encouragement to get people to pray. But who prayed in Genesis chapter 1? Right. I mean, all he did there was create the heavens and the earth, the solar system, all of the stars, put everything into motion, and, oh, golly gee, Gomer, nobody prayed. Yes, God instituted prayer. Yes, God gave us the opportunity to participate with him, to hear the yearnings of his heart in our heart and, and, and cry out to God in accordance with his will, and then he does what he wants, what he wishes, what he desires, and what he wills gives us a part to play in that. But here in the city of Nain, verses 11 through 17, chapter 7. <laughs> and it came to pass a day after when he went to the city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and many people, and there came near to the gate of the city, and there was a dead man carried out. A what? Yeah, a dead man. A dead man. So we know he didn't have any part in the miracle. <laughs> a dead man. And his mother, the only son, the only son, get this, the only son of a mother who was a widow. So she didn't have now a husband, and he was the only son, so now she had no sons. <coughs> and, and so she's a widow, and now her son is dead. And many of the people were with her. And when Jesus saw her, look at this, the value of compassion. He had compassion on her. Don't be critical. Don't be judgmental. Over people. Well, if he would have stayed out of traffic, he wouldn't have got run over. Well, if he wouldn't have been DWI, he wouldn't have went off that cliff in the first place. Have compassion. Compassion moved the Lord many, many times, and this is one of them. And Jesus had compassion on her and said to her, don't cry, and came and touched the buyer, and they that bore him stood still, and he said, young man, young man, wasn't an old man. You see that? We never see any, any old individuals raised from the dead in the Bible. Young man. This was the third of the, 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 the three that Jesus raised from the dead during his earthly ministry. Remember Jairus? 
uh, and, 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 and that was, you know, that was a young girl, about 12 years of age, the Bible even says, uh, raised her up here. It says, young man, young man, I say to you, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. I bet that got their attention carrying that casket through the city and out, and they're on their way to the graveyard. And Man, he, he sits up and, and starts talking. Sits up and starts talking. And, and, and he delivered him to his mother. And fear came upon all. I'll bet. And they said, a great prophet is risen among us, and God has visited his people, and rumor went forth throughout Judea and throughout all the region. And the disciples of John showed him these things. That's the, that's the next miracle that we have here that we have here uh, in, the, uh, in the book of Luke. Again, no human participation. doesn't have to be human participation. God can do what he wants, uh, and, and he's God. Or, or he, can use, he can use humans as part of it. Now look at the next chapter, chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 22. And it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Now look at verse 23. Don't you love it when the guy whose idea it is, he kind of fizzles and, and leaves you kind of carrying the bag? He's the one that says, hey guys, let's go to the other side of the lake. And they all bail in, and everybody gets on an oar, and then he falls asleep. He didn't say, take me to the other side of the lake while I take a nap. He said, let's all go. You know, somebody organizes a work day. Hey, come on, everybody. We're going to tear that wall out, and we're going to build 20 more feet on the sanctuary, and, 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 we're gonna, and everybody shows up with tools and jackhammers and, 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 and air nailers and, and big tool belts, and everybody gets in on it and, and starts to work. And then the guy that organized it all and stirred everybody up goes back and pulls up a chair, gets out a cup of coffee. He takes a nap. He takes a nap. So if it appears that they might be just a little bit irritated when the storm comes up, I get it. I'm not defending him. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, just pointing out what I'm sure you obviously have already thought about. Came to pass on a certain day. He went to a ship with the disciples and said, Let's, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. And then the next verse says, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in danger of sinking, and came to him and woke him and said, Master, Master, we are all going to die. And he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Isn't that a great question? I said, isn't that a great question? Why would he say, where is your faith? Why would he say that? Where's your faith? Number one, faith has to be based on the word of God. Faith has to be based on what he said. Faith has to come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the only way faith comes. Faith doesn't come by praying for faith. Faith doesn't come by watching other people exercise their faith. Faith doesn't come by reading. Faith cometh, Romans 10, 17, the only verse in the whole Bible that tells you how faith comes. Faith cometh by hearing. hearing and hearing. As important as worship is, worship doesn't, doesn't raise faith. As important as serving is, serving does not increase faith. As important as loving is, loving does not bring about faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the way God designed the system to function and operate. And the word of God had already been spoken to them. He said, let us launch and go over to the other side. He didn't say, let us go halfway and sink. They said, we're sinking and we're going to die. He had said, we're going to the other side. Which will it be? Are you going to believe the circumstance and start confessing the circumstance because it looks like we're going to sink? Don't you care that we're all going to die? We are full of water and we're all going to die. And he said, that's not what I said. I said, we're going to the other side. 
I said, we're going to the other side. Let's launch our boat and let us go to the other side. And they woke him up and said, we are all going to die. One of these things is not like the other. See, he said, we're going to the other side. They said, we're all going to drown. He said all of your needs were going to be met according to his riches and glory and the windows of heaven would pour out more than you'd have room enough to contain and that by whose stripes you were healed. That's what he said. That's what he said. I said, that's what he said. And that's the source of faith. That's the source of faith. They could have stood right up and said, in no way we're going down because he said. We're not going to sink because of what he said. They didn't have to wake him up. They had to stand on what he said, not wake him up. They woke him up and they disagreed with what he said. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and they went, oh, wow. They, they, they were astounded. They were impressed. And then he rebuked him and said, where is your faith? And they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? Well, if you have to wonder... Let, let, let's make it clear to you. This is not like any other man. This man came from heaven and descended to earth and was born as an infant and lived a perfect sinless life. This man was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, who, who is God among us. This is wonderful, counselor, prince of peace, the son of God. This is the second person of the Godhead. This is the one who called out of darkness, let there be light, and created the worlds in the beginning. And all things were created by him, and there was not anything made that he didn't make. That's what kind of man this is. This is the man that calls into the tomb and says, come out, Lazarus, and he comes a marching out. This is the man who, 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 who created everything that is, who will go to the cross a short time after this and bear the sins of the entire human race so that only through him will be redemption for any, any individual and everyone can come. That's what manner of man this is. I mean, quieting a little bitty windstorm is little compared to what's coming rebuking and, and, and cursing a fig tree, that, 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 that's nothing compared to descending into hell and conquering hell, death, and darkness and walking out with the keys. I'm he that was and is and is to come, was dead and am alive, and I'm going to live forevermore. This is the one whom all authority will bow to, and he'll prop his feet up on it like a footstool. What manner of man is this? Not like any other. This is the one who's going to hang on the cross up on Calvary's hill and become sin for us, though he knew no sin himself, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what manner of man this is. This is the one whom God himself said, uh, he, he's come to heal the brokenhearted. Praise God. He's come to deliver the captives. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is anointed. This is the one who's going to receive the Holy Ghost right from God the Father and shed forth and pour out on the day of Pentecost. So the Spirit of God is in us and on us and with us ever since. That's what manner of man this is. This is the man, not what manner of man. This is the man. This is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through him. This is the one whose, whose name alone is given. And there is no other name under heaven given among men than his, whereby we must be saved. This is the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords and exalted over all. This one is the captain of our salvation, our one and only redeemer. This one is Jesus who loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That's what manner of man this is. He quiets a little bit of a storm and the wind stops and the rain quits pelting down and they're impressed. You ain't seen nothing yet. This is the one who crown, we crown him with many crowns, praise God. This is the captain of the angelic hosts of heaven. Amen. This is the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what manner of man this is. What manner of man is this? He commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. He commands demons, and they obey him. He commands the planets and the sun, and they obey him. He commands disease, and it obeys him. He commands the dead to get up off their, off their briar and, and walk. That's what manner of man he is. 
So we, 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 we shortchange uh, ourselves in, in having too small of an image of the God whom we serve. He's not some man. He's not just some, some, some anointed man. He's God. And he alone will be exalted. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. And everyone will sing the praises of our wonderful, majestic, matchless Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. To whom be glory both now and forever. Amen and amen and amen and amen. You got time for one more? Got time for one more? Let's one. Let's let's see which one. Which one? Praise God. There's so many of them here. There's just so many of them here. Hallelujah. Well, let me look over at chapter chapter 19, chapter 19 of Luke. Chapter 19. Let's just go through just a couple of these quick. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. And, and, and chapter 19 of Luke, and verse 28, when he just spoken, he went and, and ascended up into Jerusalem. And it came to pass, and he was coming near Beth, Bethphage and Bethany, and the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, and he said, Go to the village over against you, and entering in, you'll find a colt tied up there, on which never a man sent. Loose him and bring him here to me. And if any man asks you, Why do you do this? You'll say, because the Lord has need of him. And they were sent their way, and they found even as it had been said. And as they were untying the colt, the owner said, why are you taking our colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. See, do what he tells you to do. Yes. That, that's just what they said. That's what he said to say, right? Yes. I said, isn't that what he said to say? Yes. And so that's what they did. And they brought him to Jesus and cast their garments on the colt. And Jesus said, and they went and they spread their clothes in the way. What do we call this? What do we celebrate this every year? Palm Sunday. And when they were come near, even the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God, loud voice and all the mighty works that he had seen, saying, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, you've never seen that one? Huh? And so, so he comes in. Now, look at the human element again. He told them what was going to happen. We know that as a word of wisdom. It wasn't a prediction. It wasn't a guess. It wasn't a prophecy. It wasn't a hope. He told them what was going to happen. Our God knows the end from the beginning. And what hasn't happened yet from ancient days long ago, he, 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 he can declare. And so he tells them, this is what's going to happen. And if any man comes out, here's what you say to him. And, they go, and, and humans get to be involved. All they have to do is just do what he said. They didn't get around the corner and say, you think we're going to find a donkey? Where do you think? We're? Well, I don't think we're ever even going to find one. He said, go over here and we're going to find one, but I, I don't think so. Let's just wait for something else to take notice. And no, they, they just did what he said. And, and when they came and said, why are you untying the coal? He, told, he did exactly what he said. And then they came. And again, you see the human element involved. Chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> 7 through 14. Great, great examples of the ministry of helps. Now, we skipped over one because it was also in all of the other Gospels. And if you're taking notes, write down Luke chapter, Luke chapter 9, 10 through 17. That was the feeding of the 5,000. Remember that? That's in all four Gospels. The only miracle that's included in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. And do you remember there how the ministry of helps, how they participated together? Remember that? Jesus, he, 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 he's the only one with compassion on the people. Yeah. I mean, they're tired. They want, to, they, want to, they want some rest. They come up, and he's been preaching for three days. You think my sermons are long. He, you, think, you think our services are long. He preached for three days. And, and nobody had had anything to eat that day. And, and so he looks at his disciples and says, hey, hey, you, you all feed the rest. Remember, we did this one day. We did this. We had, we had five little buns, and we had two little, I don't think they were, were they pieces of fish? Or they, we, had, we had chicken strips. Don't tell anybody, because we're being we're unbiblical. But we had chicken strips, two chicken strips and five little biscuits in a bag. And we had 50 people stand up and say, okay, distribute this among those 50 people. We had counted them out, 50 people. 
except, except this group right here, this group right here, it was a hundred times that big. A hundred times that many, and they ate from the same bag. And there were 12 baskets of leftovers. This is called a miracle. A miracle. And, and, and we talked about those, those 12 and how you know, each of them got half of a, half a fish fillet and, and half, a, half a bun. And we took those five and we broke them up and we had 10 halves and we had, we had these two pieces of fish. And, and so go ahead and feed those 50 on that. You couldn't even feed 50, and they had 100 times that many, and that was just the men. And it said, plus their women and children in one of the other Gospels. So there may have been 15 or 20,000 there, all in that one little, one little bag. And, and all along the way through the miracle, he lets the staff help. He lets the ministry of helps help. That, that's just, this is the way our God has designed, has determined. See, God... God created everything that is according to his own heart and his own will. And he did not make you and he didn't make me an inanimate object. He gave you the freedom to choose whether or not you're going to help him, whether or not you're going to serve him. He called some of those men and, and they, they stumbled and fell over themselves and they ran to follow him. He called some other ones and they didn't. He called one and he said, you got too much stuff, get rid of it. He wouldn't get rid of it. That was too big a price to pay. He didn't become one of his followers. There were some who wanted to be his followers, and he preached one hard message, and they all left. One message that they didn't like, and they left. Never to follow him again. He gave us a will. By his design, not because we asked for it, not because we prayed for it, not because we wanted it. This is God's design. Let's come back to that in just a minute. All right, what chapter are we in? Luke 22, starting with verse 7. And then they came to the day of unleavened bread, the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John and said, go prepare the Passover that we may eat. And they said, where will you that we prepare it? And he said, behold, when you're entered into the city... There'll be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. See, this, this, is, this is God. This is God in the flesh telling him what's going to happen. You'll meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters. And you'll say to the good men of the house, the master says, where's the guest chamber that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he'll show you a large upper room furnished. Make you there ready. They went, found just as he had said, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down with his 12 disciples with him and said, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Can you see it again? Can you see it again? You see the human element, him allowing people to be involved. Now, back to the 5,000. He's got 5,000 people. He's preached to them for three days. This day they've had nothing to eat. And what's he say to his disciples? They come and say, Master... Master, uh, great church service, Pastor. Great message. We got a lot out of it, but uh, <clears throat> the Packers play at noon. Uh, oh, no, we can't say that. That wouldn't be spiritual. <laughs> but on. they are playing the Bears, so that probably would. <laughs> right? Is that today? Yeah. Huh? I'm just looking to see who will acknowledge. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is today. Uh, So they come to him and they say, uh, <laughs> uh, Jesus, uh, these people are hungry and they're tired. We should kind of wrap this up and, and like send them away. And Jesus said, oh, they're tired? Uh-huh. Are they hungry? Uh, uh-huh. Well, we should give them something to eat then. And, and Philip, you know, he's like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is my hometown. It was. I'm from here. There aren't any stores out here. There's like one little deli over there on the counter. And, and this one, he, he's not, there's no way. 
There's no way. And, and if we had, had two-thirds of a year's wages, 200 penny worth, we couldn't even buy just a little bit for everybody, even if there was like a big bakery or something. This just, Jesus said, have, go, go have them all sit down. You're going to feed them. Yeah, have them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Okay. But where are we going to get bread? Just go, just one thing at a time, Philip. And, and, and so just go, go have them sit down. So, so they go, all go sit down. Did he let them participate? Let them. He made them. He just, he just said, do it. And so they got them all sit down, 50, 100, 50, 100. And then he said, well, you know, we don't have anything to give them. He said, well, you go find something. And that's when they had that interaction. And then one of them came back, and he had this little bag lunch. You know, it's either his, what he's going to eat for lunch or maybe he went grocery shopping for, you know, for mom or something. But he's coming, and he's got this whole bag and said, we went everywhere we looked, and this is all we have. And, you know, they're kind of like defending their position. Just send them all home. And, and he said, that's enough. Go make them sit down, and, uh, and, and then you're going to serve them. Imagine these 12 guys. You got five biscuits. We're going to break them in half. You got two little pieces of fish. He said, all right, take it. And distribute, give them all something to eat. And they start giving them to eat. I'll guarantee you, human nature, they do not realize until everything is all over. They have no realization they're caught up in a miracle. They don't realize the power of God is functioning and working and he's doing his will and they get to be part of it. That's always the ministry of helps. And everybody eats and everybody's full, that means them too. And, and, and they've eaten and are full. And then Jesus looks at them like they have an art. How long is it going to take these 12 to serve 15, 20,000 people? Hours and hours and hours. And they all get done. And Jesus says to them, well, you can go home now and rest. You've worked hard already. Oh, no, the meeting's done. That's when the minister helps goes to work. Go dismiss them. Now, Jesus is orderly. Our God's orderly about everything. Let all things be done decent and in order. So they're dismissing them 50 at a time, 100 at a time. Everybody's going. Everybody's going. And then he looks at them and says, get out the vacuum cleaners, get out the brooms, get out the hokey, get out, clean everything up so that nothing is wasted. They're not done yet. Everybody else is gone, everybody else is eating, and they're out there working, and they clean up all the crumbs, and they, and they got 12 baskets left over. And then what does he say? Go down, put it all in the boat, and now row to the other side. And oh, by the way, did I tell you, there's going to be a storm. Kind of a theme. And he goes up and he prays alone while they go rowing across the sea. Miracles take place, and people get to be involved. And people get to be involved. And we just looked at those two incidents, one on, the, uh, on what we call Palm Sunday when he came in, and, and they got to be involved. You go find me that colt. You don't think he could do that on his own, by himself? He already knew what was going to take place. Our God gives us the opportunity to assist and help and serve. That's part of his design and part of his plan. Last verse, last verse here in the book of Luke that we'll look at today, chapter 23. I want you to look at this. I want you to see this. It's found in three of the four Gospels. The man's name is written in the Bible. In one of the, in Matthew, it even tells us his, his children's names. Rufus and Alexander are this man's sons. In, in, in Luke chapter 23, Jesus has now been arrested. He's been betrayed and then arrested. He's been denied by Peter. He's been stationed before the council. That all happened in chapter 22. In chapter 3, he comes before Pilate and Herod, and he's sentenced to die. He's scourged with that Roman scourging whip, and now he's being led through the streets. And the people are crying out in verse 21, crucify him, crucify him. 
And Pilate asks them in verse 22, what evil has he done? I found no cause of death. I'll release him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released to them for sedition and murder. That was Barabbas, who was cast into prison, whom they desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Look at the next verse. Verse 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold on one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. That verse gets mentioned probably once every five years at an Easter service by someone, that Simon of Cyrene, coming out of the country, was caught, was laid hold of, and they laid Jesus' cross on him that he might bear it. This man was forced into helping Jesus. He was not asked. He was not given the option. He was not presented with the opportunity. Would you like to help the Lord Jesus? See, they weren't interested in helping the Lord Jesus. Let's make this clear. They were not looking with pity and having mercy on Jesus. They didn't want him to die of exhaustion, collapsed on his knees, unable to bear the weight of that cross. They wanted to make sure he got up to the top of that hill. And they took his cross. John is the one gospel that doesn't include this, and it says he bore his cross. When he left there, he was carrying it. And at some point, he could no longer bear the weight of it. And they grabbed this man out of the crowd. One of the gospels said his two sons, Rufus and Alexander, his, he came there for the Passover. Cyrene is all the way over in North Africa. It's in Libya. That's on the other side of Egypt. This is a long journey that this man came with his sons to come to the Passover in Jerusalem. And it said he was coming in right at that time, coming in out of the country right at that time. And they were coming out with these three condemned to death individuals, the two thieves and Jesus the Christ. And it says they took him and they forced him. This is a Greek word. Uh, the Greek word uh, is actually pronounced Egenar. Uh, I'm going to give him my best shot. Ingarusen. Ingarusen. That sounds Greek to me. Yeah. Ingarusen is the Greek word. And it means, it means to be pressed into public service or to be forced. To be pressed, listen to this. This is the last person on planet Earth that ever helped Jesus. We've got people that helped him by putting him in their boat and, it, and, and they were part of a miracle. We've got people that were, that were given the opportunity to have people sit down in groups of 50 and 100 and distribute bread and fish and go clean up the leftovers and, 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 and help the people out when the meeting was over. We've got people, go, go and find me a colt to ride into town on. Find me a ride. We've got people, go prepare the upper room so that we can have a miracle service in there, the Last Supper. And now we've got one other person and your Bible calls him by name, tells you who his family members are, tells you where he's from. But it specifies this. He was given no, no opportunity to serve. He was given no option to participate. He was forced. He was forced. And yet he got caught up in the greatest miracle that ever took place. Jesus went right up and hung on the cross. Which are you? Are you one of those who you've been pressed into public service and forced to serve God? Nobody is. 
The Roman government doesn't wield swords and spears and walk in here in armor with shields and grab you and say, you are going to go serve us and help us today. And God doesn't do that either. God instituted the ministry of helps back in a garden east of Eden in the second chapter of the book of Genesis when he put the man he had created in a garden and gave him a job and said, dress it and keep it. Oh, by the way, while you're dressing and keeping it, Mr. Horticulturist and, and, and Mr. Agriculturist, while you're doing that, name everything too. Well, you're God. Can't you do it yourself? That's not our God. Our God, his, those who he's created, he gives us the opportunity to help him and serve him. And he said, no, you name him. Name every bird. Name every plant. We were watching birds out in a bird feeder one day. And Paula said, what is that one? And I said, I don't know. That's a gunko. And, and she said, who named that thing anyway? I said, Adam. <laughs> Adam was given a responsibility to name hippopotamus and rhinoceros and, 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 and giraffe. Nobody said that has to be a giraffe. Adam gave him their names. And that's what God gave him to do. And then God looked down one day and said, it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make a, woo, a helper, a help mate, a mate who will help him, a helper suitable to be his companion, it says in the Hebrew. A helper. God instituted the helps ministry before sin. It's not a punishment. The helps ministry. Adam, you're going to help me. I'm going to create Eve out of you, and she's going to help you. And the ministry of helps, we could go back in the book of Exodus and we could see it and we could see Moses and, and God taking the spirit off Moses and putting it on those elders and, and, and those people he placed on over hundreds and fifties and, 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 and thousands and tens and, and they were his ministry of helps. He sat down on a rock one day. He sat right down on a rock and he was growing weary and, and, and the, the staff was, was going lower and lower and lower. And the lower the staff went, the, the more victory the enemy had. And, and when he held that staff up, the more victory the Israelite army would have. And, and they got a rock and they put underneath him. Who did? Aaron and Hur. And they put that rock underneath him. And one held this arm, and one held this arm, and he held the rod, and they held his arms up. The ministry of helps. They helped him. And great victory was won that day. This is the way our God has designed life to work for all of his people to be involved with helping him. You will never be a Simon of Cyrene. He will never force you. You will not be pressed into service without an act of your free will. He set the ministry of helps in the church, and whosoever will, at least in this church. I grew up traveling. My dad was in traveling sales, and we went to a lot of different churches and a lot of different places, and a lot of them were organized differently than that. But uh, here in this church, uh, it may not be exactly what you want to do because that position may be taken already. Reverend Neck, stand up. Uh, Reverend Kevin Neck, uh, veteran of, of, of uh, assistant pastor uh, out on the West Coast, pastored in St. Joseph, Missouri, pastored here in the state of uh, Wisconsin up in Chippewa Falls. And ever since 1980, 1989, he's been here at Living Word helping very faithfully very faithfully he's the senior elder here so if you fill out a helps ministry form say where would you like to serve if you put senior elder well somebody's just going to say you know thank you we, we we appreciate your availability but that position's already taken that position's already taken now if you want to be a pianist thank you thank you that position's taken but it's also open because we can use more than one. And we've got two or three or four other ones here, but, but uh, I, I wish I could play the piano. I'd be one. They, they just do a tremendous job. Love to see the anointing do that. But there's a place for you to serve. Amen. There's a place for you to serve, but God, an angel, or, or, or me, or us, we're not going to force you. We're not Roman soldiers going to come in, grab you off the street, jerk you away from your two boys, and say, you have to do this right now. 
What if I don't? The sword's coming out. That's what's going to happen if you don't. There's no arguing with the Roman soldiers. They tell you you're going to do it, you're going to do it. It's not that way in the church. In the church, you have options because God gave you a free will and he wants you to do it freely, gratefully, cheerfully. In Jesus' name, let's stand. Hallelujah. Hope you're enjoying that. We're going to finish up the book of Luke. We've got two other miracles and and then we're going to go right into it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. The great miracle in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, and that'll kick us right into the, 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 the holiday season. Man, we get to preach about angels we have heard on high. Stables and shepherds. And the plan of God to save the entire race of humans. Hallelujah. I hope you've had a great time this morning. I sure have. Thanks for allowing me to come to church and be with you. And uh, I'm so glad to be part of the family of God, aren't you? If you know anybody that's not, we have a promise in our Bible that the Lord Jesus is coming. He's returning. He's coming back. We have no guarantee that it'll be in our lifetime. We have no guarantee it won't be before sunset today. We don't know when it'll be. Everybody that's predicted so far has been wrong. But everybody that looks expectantly and anticipating and holding holding on to the faith and waiting, they're right. Every one of you are right to continue to look for his return and work like it'll be today. Be prepared for it to be imminent and immediate. Be planned for it to live your life out. But when you look around, see others in your world that don't have the assurance of their salvation and they've never been a confessing Christian, confessing Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, share the gospel with them. Tell them that God's not mad at him. He's not upset at him. He's not angry at him. He provided a way for him. He provided a savior. And if they'll put their faith in what he did for us and confess him as their Lord, that they'll be saved as well. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be hesitant because you think you might be rejected. You may be. Be bold. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin. On Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.